Welcome to this timely program titled Sanctuary Cities Legitimate Law Enforcement Policy or Rogue Action, co-sponsored by the Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice and the Commission on Immigration of the American Bar Association. My name is Karen Grise. I'm special counsel here in the Washington, D.C. office of Freed Frank, Harris, Shriver, and Jacobson. And for purposes of this program this morning, I serve as special advisor to the Commission on Immigration. I'm delighted to be your moderator for the program this morning, and I'm especially honored to be sharing the stage with this distinguished group of panelists. Um, I've moderated a lot of programs for the ABA before, um, but I have learned so much preparing for this one because this is not um, a topic on which I work every day, so the materials that we've gotten and the preparation that I've been able to do with these folks has been really instructive for me, and I'm very pleased to have the chance to offer this wide range of diverse backgrounds, experiences, and perspectives to all of you this morning. Um, in short, today's program is gonna explore in depth the sanctuary city concept that has come uh, so much into prominence in the national discourse since the recent executive orders on immigration enforcement priorities. As you'll hear later in the program, sanctuary is not a new concept uh, in the law or in practice, but is really in the forefront of some of the discussions today. We'll be talking about the definitions of sanctuary cities, the various ways that state and local jurisdictions can limit their cooperation with federal enforcement authorities, the consequences of those decisions for local jurisdictions and their immigrant populations. The panelists will be talking about various local policies, uh, detainers, litigation around detainer issues, and the very practical, real daily questions of whether sanctuary city policies do or don't create safer, more prosperous communities. So with apologies to all of the panelists, I'm gonna give only very brief introductions to each of them and direct your attention to the full biographies that are in your materials. I'm going to introduce the speakers in the order in which we intend to proceed this morning. Um, first, to my immediate left, Michelle Waslin. Michelle is Senior Research and Policy Analyst for the American Immigration Council. And in her uh, role there, she focuses primarily on high-skilled immigration and enforcement issues. To Michelle's left, Paramitha Shah. Paramitha is the Associate Director of the National Immigration Project of the National Lawyers Guild. Next to Paramitha, Betsy Cavendish, the General Counsel to DC Mayor Muriel Bowser. And then to Betsy's immediate left, um, Tom Manger. Tom is the Chief of Police for the Montgomery County Police Department and also, interestingly, the President of the Major Cities Chiefs Association. So we're looking for him to wear a couple of hats in this program, too. To Tom's left, Chad Mizell from the Department of Justice. Uh, Tom, I'm sorry, Chad is counsel to the Deputy Attorney General and will be bringing us the DOJ perspective. Then to Chad's left, Tracy Short. Um, Tracy is the principal legal advisor for ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement within the Department of Homeland Security. Um, so he'll be our second government speaker this morning. And uh, at the, <laughs> no pun intended, far left, <laughs> um, Michael Nefak. Um, Michael is a principal in the DC uh, region of Jackson Lewis, PC. Um, Michael himself is former general counsel of ICE. So I'm really looking forward to uh, his opportunity to reflect coming from both the the private practice side, but also with the government ICE enforcement experience to sort of round out our discussion. So our, <laughs> I, we probably messed up the seating order, if not the, no if not the introduction order. So our plan is to have brief presentations from each of the speakers, um, with Michelle starting us off with the history, background, and basically framing of the issue. Then um, each of the panelists will speak. Then we'll have some time for a roundtable discussion that I'll facilitate um, so that um, 
people can uh, you know, speak among themselves, respond to some questions that we've prepared, and then we have a good amount of time set aside at the end for question and answer from the audience. Um, I have a housekeeping matter, which is that we have only one mic for the Q&A for the audience, so when it comes the time, if you do have a question, we'd like you to um, indicate that you have a question, raise your hand or stand and wait for the mic to come to you, and then identify yourself and your uh, company or organizational affiliation before you ask your question. Reminders to everyone that the program is um, being broadcast and recorded, so uh, everyone bear that in mind when you make your comments or ask your questions. So I have um, just uh, one thought to start us off on the panel. The people uh, who helped organize this reminded me of a quote from Justice Kennedy in the Arizona litigation, the um, Arizona versus United States litigation from 2012, and it's not about sanctuary cities at all, but it's a, it's a very good device to um, help set the stage for us in the discussion we hope to have this morning. So I'm gonna kick it off with this. In talking about the relationship between state policing and federal immigration enforcement, Justice Kennedy wrote, the sound exercise of national power over immigration depends on the nation's meeting its responsibility to base its laws on a political will informed by searching, thoughtful, and rational civic discourse. So we begin this panel with that goal in mind to facilitate a searching, thoughtful, and rational civic discourse on the subject of where national immigration authority interacts with state policing. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn to Michelle's opening presentation. Great, thank you so much, Karen. And thank you so much to the ABA for inviting me to be part of this panel this morning. Um, my job was to kind of present an overview and the basics so that we could get this conversation started. Um, as you all know, over the past several decades, states, counties, and cities have adopted a variety of different policies that restrict their cooperation <coughs> with federal authorities to enforce immigration law. And elected officials and law enforcement officials in many localities, as we will hear today, have, de have determined that this is in their community's best interest to limit their role in deportation for a variety of reasons. And you'll hear from the other panelists today, but generally they believe that these policies policies allow them to determine best how they protect and serve their own communities and allows them to decide how to spend their own resources. And they truly believe that these policies make their communities safer. Now some people call these policies that limit or restrict cooperation um, sanctuary policies. Now we know that the administration believes that they are sanctuary policies and that they violate federal law and they've threatened to withhold funding uh, from these so-called sanctuary cities and have attempted to publicly shame them uh, with published reports of their alleged failures to protect the community. But I strongly believe that sanctuary policy is a misnomer. Contrary to what many believe, so-called sanctuary policies do not shelter unauthorized immigrants from detection. Immigrants are deported from sanctuary jurisdictions every single day. They don't shield immigrants um, from prosecution for criminal activities. The police can enforce all criminal laws against immigrants who commit crimes. Uh, so starting there, this morning I'm going to discuss first what policies are included under this umbrella of sanctuary policies, how so-called sanctuary cities do cooperate with the federal government, how they are in compliance with federal law, and then I'm going to go over the evidence that we have that these cities actually are safe and economically vibrant. So first, uh, what policies are considered under this umbrella of sanctuary policies? They take many forms, and some examples include prohibiting 287G agreements. These are agreements through which ICE deputizes local law enforcement officers to enforce federal immigration laws. Um, sanctuary policies can also be refusing to enter into a contract with the federal government to hold immigrants in detention. It could be restricting the police or other city workers from asking about immigration status from individuals that they encounter or serve or, or arrest. Sanctuary policies can be refusing to allow ICE into their local jails without a warrant. It can mean restricting immigration enforcement in sensitive locations like hospitals and schools. 
And a sanctuary policy can also be restricting local police responses, um, restricting them from honoring all immigration detainers. Now, I know Paramita is going to talk a lot more about detainers, um, but since this is the one that we hear about most frequently, I need to give a little background here. Um, for our purposes, an immigration detainer is a tool that's used by the Department of Homeland Security and ICE specifically when they identify potentially deportable people um, who are held in jails or prisons. And a detainer is a request by ICE asking local law enforcement officials to hold that individual for a period of up to 48 hours longer than they would have usually held that person. So after bail has been posted, after the charges have been dropped, or after the person has served out their sentence, to hold that person an additional amount of time so that ICE can then assume custody. These detainers are not judicial warrants, and compliance with detainers is voluntary. So I said that sanctuary policies, or cities with sanctuary policies, do cooperate with the federal government on immigration. Um, and they do this in a variety of ways. So even in any sanctuary jurisdiction, officials send uh, federal immigration agents the fingerprints of any person, including immigrants, that is booked into a jail or prison. And the federal government uses those fingerprints and that information to identify non-citizens for deportation. And this is what we know as the Secure Communities Program, sharing fingerprints. And this is a mandatory program for all jurisdictions across the country. Uh, sanctuary cities can also cooperate in joint task forces and other joint operations with ICE and DHS, operations to target gangs or trafficking rings or any other number of crimes. Sanctuary jurisdictions may even rent jail space to the federal government to house immigrant de detainees. And even in sanctuary cities, these jurisdictions may honor detainers from the federal government in circumstances, in certain circumstances. Um, in many cases, these jurisdictions will honor detainers if the individual has been convicted of a crime rather than just charged with a crime. Or they will honor the detainer if the individual has been charged with or convicted of a felony as opposed to a misdemeanor. So one thing that we have heard often recently is that the sanctuary cities are not in compliance with federal law. Again, we're going to hear more about this from the other expert lawyers on the panel. Um, but specifically, some people do claim that these sanctuary policies violate 8 U.S.C. Section 1373, and this is a federal statute that prohibits state and local governments from enacting laws or policies that limit communication about information regarding the immigration or citizenship status of individuals. So pursuant to Section 1373, states and localities may not prohibit or restrict sending or receiving or requesting information regarding the citizenship or immigration status, lawful or unlawful, of any individual from federal immigration authorities. They may not prohibit or restrict maintaining information regarding an individual's immigration status. They may not uh, prohibit or restrict exchanging information regarding an individual's immigration status. But by its plain language, uh, Section 1373 only applies to sharing of information regarding an individual's citizenship and immigration status. So policies that do not explicitly limit communication with DHS about an individual's citizenship or immigration status and do not forbid the maintenance of such information are not violations. Uh, moreover, Section 1373 does not mandate that jurisdictions comply with immigration detainers. It does not prohibit policies or laws that restrict compliance with detainers. And it does not require state or local enforcement to collect information on immigration status. And it doesn't prevent jurisdictions from limiting the collection of that information. So many would argue that these policies that I've described are not in violation of federal law. Uh, but finally, what I want to talk about is that we've heard concerns that these jurisdictions that limit their cooperation with ICE are basically allowing criminals to run free. They're failing to deal with threats to public safety and national security. However, there is certainly evidence that the opposite is true. Of course, there is plenty of evidence that immigrants are less likely to commit crimes than native-born Americans. And many cities with large immigrant communities are among the safest communities in the country. 
Now, police officials will tell you, and probably will tell you, that it's easier for them to serve and protect their communities when there's trust between the police and the communities, and when all residents are willing to cooperate and report crimes. And this is especially important right now. There's a lot of fear in communities, and even in sanctuary jurisdictions, immigrants are fearful. And there have just been reports coming out this week showing that in Los Angeles, Denver, El Paso, and other cities, the reporting of crimes, including domestic abuse and sexual assault, is down in these cities with large immigrant populations. It's down since the beginning of the year. So if immigrants are not going to commit crimes, I'm sorry, if immigrants will not report crimes that they witness or that they're victims of, then the perpetrators may not be arrested and everyone in the community is less safe. So if my house is being robbed or if my house is on fire and the only witness is an unauthorized immigrant, I sure as heck want that person to call the fire department or call the police to report that to protect my house, um, regardless of their immigration status. Uh, just on Wednesday, the attorneys general of New York, California, Rhode Island, Washington, Oregon, and the District of Columbia released an excellent new report. It's called Setting the Record Straight on Local Involvement in Federal Civil Immigration Enforcement. And that report I would recommend to all of you. It makes many of the same points that I made here today. And from a law enforcement perspective, um, it tells many um, examples of immigrants who have come forward and um, been very helpful in the arrest of criminals. Um, and it also really explains in detail why these sanctuary policies are good for the states that they represent. represent. Um, and then another study I want to point to is a recent study, a 2017 report by Professor Tom Wong of the University of California, San Diego, uh, together with the Center for American Progress. And they found that in sanctuary counties, they have lower crime rates and higher economic indicators than in non-sanctuary counties. So they looked at counties that both have sanctuary policies and those that do not, and they found that on average, there are 35 and a half fewer crime crimes committed per 10,000 people in sanctuary uh, counties compared to non-sanctuary counties. They found that median household income is $4,000 higher in sanctuary counties than in non-sanctuary counties. And for those who fear that this is driven by income gains among Latinos at the expense of whites, they actually found that among whites, median household income is actually more than $2,000 higher in sanctuary counties uh, than in non-sanctuary counties. They found that poverty is lower. Reliance on public assistance is lower in sanctuary counties. Labor force participation, including white labor force participation, is higher in sanctuary counties. And finally, unemployment is lower in sanctuary counties. The employment rate was actually 1.1% lower in sanctuary counties compared to non-sanctuary counties. So um, in conclusion, I know that I'm looking forward to my fellow panelists going into much more detail about these issues that I raised, and I hope that I have been able to lay the groundwork for a constructive conversation, and I look forward to your questions and your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, and you stole my next line, Paramitha. That was exactly it. I was going to ask, can you take us deeper now into the world of detainers, constitutional issues around detainers, and what some of the litigation challenges have been, and sort of what's, what's the landscape, at least on the um, existing detainer litigation. So thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I also wanted to open this with you know, agreeing with Michelle that sanctuary policies really are an exercise of basic state and local powers to regulate for the health and safety and welfare of their residents. Um, some people may think that you've, people have done this to stop mass deportations, but really, that's, really that's the only motivation. Many local leaders recognize that sanctuary policies are vital to preserving police community relations and ensuring that residents feel safe reporting crimes and accessing basic government services. And still others are responding to the risk that collaboration with federal immigration officials could lead to racial profiling and civil liberties violations or trying to remedy uh, discriminatory policing problems. And more recently, public schools and universities have voiced concern that more aggressive immigration enforcement will jeopardize student safety and interfere with their school's educational missions. But I know the question always is whether they are lawful. 
And there's a long answer, which I'll get into, and there's a short one, and the answer is yes, they are lawful. Um, I've been practicing uh, law since 1998, um, and I've been involved with what's been called sanctuary policies for over 10 years. Um, and I think during the first years, I've seen the birth of the Homeland Security um, Agency. And during those first years, DHS and DOJ attempted in many different ways to merge the functions of state and police and local police with federal immigration enforcement through programs like Secure Communities, which Michelle went into. And they did rely on this federal mechanism called immigration detainers. And in, at that time in 2006, 2007, and it's, you know, detainers have been here for decades. Um, when Secure Communities was launched, nobody really knew what they were. About 20,000 were issued. After Secure Communities began, hundreds of thousands of detainers started pouring out of the Department of Homeland Securities. And the landscape of immigration enforcement changed radically. And that impacted communities across the country. We all saw how people somehow managed to get a detainer um, and somehow stay detained, even after they may have been granted bail, after the charges were dismissed or charges were dropped. And we began hearing of extended detentions through the immigration detainer. And many people around the country, most people actually, there was so much confusion, they believed they were compulsory. And this mechanism actually be, was instrumental to beginning what we think is some of the kind of the largest mass deportation policies we've had in, in our federal government for many years. So as Michelle said, the detainer is a request. It looks like this, it is a form, right? And it's usually a form that, it, that ICE has, it says that it's going to intend to assume custody of an individual for the purposes of putting them into removal proceedings. A jurisdiction that complies with an ICE detainer is engaging in a warrantless arrest. DHS has already conceded to that. Um, and who is the jailer at that time? It is the local jurisdiction, because the local jurisdiction has the body. They are the jailer. And as we're going to see later on, they will bear the brunt of liability when people are sued, let's say, for overdetention. So what are the problems um, with the detainers? Well, like I said before, I think there was a lot of confusion. Everyone thought that they were regular warrants of arrest, that they were criminal warrants, meaning that people just thought that there were outstanding warrants everywhere and that non-citizens could be picked up for just outstanding warrants. Um, people assumed that the detainer meant, concluded, that somebody was here unlawfully. I'm going to tell you why that was also wrong. And there were many errors because we found out, you know, that Detainers were lodged on U.S. citizens, on legal permanent residents, many errors involved. Um, but I think fundamentally, the arrest based on a detainer provides no judicial oversight, right? The people who are issuing these detainers are employees of the Department of Homeland Security. There's no judge overseeing what evidence is supporting, no Article III judge, right? No magistrate to look to see what is the evidence that is supporting how the detainer is being issued. And procedurally, what was very frustrating for me when I was practicing immigration law in detention centers is I could never get a copy of it. I could never get a copy of the t detainer to understand why was this person here in the first place. And I, you know, throughout the years, DHS kind of propagated this confusion that detainers were mandatory. And so community, communities and litigators at some point were forced to act. We had to act um, because we had a challenge that these detainers were, which was you know, an, an administrative tool, really shouldn't have the kind of power that DHS was saying that it was going to have. And it wasn't easy. We didn't do this overnight. Litigation didn't happen overnight. There was a debate. We went to our stakeholders, and the policies that emerged came after many, many years of debate, reasonable debate, where we talked about what was important to our communities, what is good policing, how do we protect victims, how do we protect our due process rights. It didn't come about as an arbitrary discussion around our rights. I mean, our rights are critical, but how we treat people in our communities is also especially important. So what have the courts, where have the courts landed on this? I know that's what everybody wants me to get to. And where they've landed is that first, detainers are not mandatory. In the Third Circuit, in a case called Galarza v. Salzik, um, in a case where a U.S. citizen was held on an ICE detainer, the court held that ICE detainers were not compulsory, and that actually, in a, separ in a kind of a, 
in a corresponding case, um, localities could be liable for this overdetention when it happens. Um, holding someone on a detainer is a new arrest, a new seizure that requires probable cause. In 2015, in Morales v. Chadbourne, this is a case in the First Circuit, a Rhode Island resident who was a U.S. citizen <clears throat> was held on a detainer for the second time after she had been released. In fact, this was the second time, as I said again, and even DHS conceded at that time that the detainer was like being held on a warrantless arrest. The First Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the district court's finding that detaining someone beyond their release date is an arrest under the Fourth Amendment, and it also required that ICE have probable cause to issue a detainer request. So then courts have also held that ICE detainers do not provide probable cause for arrest. In 2014, in Miranda Olivares v. Clackamas County, the Clackamas County Sheriff in Oregon held Ms. Miranda Olivares on a detainer after she could have been released on bail and then transferred her to ICE. The Federal District Court in Oregon ruled that the detainer did not provide sufficient pro proof, probable cause to allow the local jane to detain Ms. Miranda Olivares for ICE. And the court held that Clackamas County had unlawfully detained her and would have to pay damages. Many courts have also found localities to be liable for the prolonged detention of folks on an immigration detainer. This has happened um, many times. We have found that, for example, for legal permanent residents, um, we, have found, we have seen damages of upwards of 100,000. In October 2016, the Northern District of Illinois, in a class action case called Jimenez Moreno v. Napolitano, invalidated nearly all ICE detainers and found that ICE has limited authority to arrest without a warrant and that detainers on individuals in local custody generally exceed that authority. And in January, the Northern District of Dallas found that Dallas could be held liable for unlawful detention because even if ICE detainers claim to be based on probable cause of deportability, that is not probable cause for a crime. So long and short, I didn't get a chance to go into the San Francisco decision, which I'd, I'd love to get into at some point. Um, but these policies are lawful. The, thus, jurisdictions that decline detainer requests for prolonged detention are complying with federal law, not violating it. Thank you, Paramitha. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm sure we'll come back to have a chance to talk about the San Francisco and Santa Clara um, litigation before we're done. Um, we're going to move now um, to Betsy Cavendish to talk to us from the perspective of D.C. And Betsy, obviously, D.C. is a somewhat unique jurisdiction when we're talking about cities. And I know that a lot of the research that's do been done and some of what Michelle talked about is from the county perspective. So feel free to take us into um, D.C., how you, know, how you analyze D.C. in terms of its status as a jurisdiction, what it's comparable to, and what has D.C. done and what is it doing on the sanctuary front? Great. Thank you, Karen, and thank you all for coming this morning. I think Michelle set it up very well, um, discussing sanctuary cities generally and what a sometimes misleading term that can be because we can't offer and don't offer um, perfect immunity from all federal immigration law in a jurisdiction. But D.C. is a city, it's a county, and it's a state. So we have all those powers, except we're not really a state. We don't have all the powers of a state. We want to be a state. But we act like a state for many legal purposes. And so what I'll do in my um, little seven minutes here is try to go into what we think being a sanctuary city means and what it doesn't mean and how we think we are very much in compliance with federal law as she was discussing 1373. So, and, and we want to sort of expand the concept of sanctuary city beyond what it means for law enforcement and think about what it means for embracing all of our residents. So we think of being a sanctuary city as part of safer, stronger DC and part of our DC values. So as Michelle said, cities that are sanctuary cities are safer. Uh, she showed some data about that. And we believe we're all safer and stronger when people feel secure um, in their persons and that they can report, report crimes, as she mentioned. So, Granul more granularly with respect to our metropolitan police, 
Metropolitan police will not question persons about their residency or immigration status unless the member is investigating crimes involving criminal smuggling and harboring of immigrants or other crimes in which immigration status is an element. So in brief, that means we don't have a show me your papers law and if someone's been stopped for other reasons, speeding ticket or whatever, um, no one's going to be questioning their immigration status. Um, MPD won't make inquiries into the immigration, into immigration status for the purpose of determining whether an individual has violated the civil immigration laws and for enforcing their laws. And nor will MPD make any inquiry through any database solely for the purpose of inquiring about an individual's immigration status. Now, we, our MPD spends a lot of time in the immigrant community. 17% of the residents in DC are foreign born. That isn't to say they're all, <clears throat> nowhere close to that number is missing papers, but we want that whole population of people who are foreign born to feel comfortable and secure in their persons and that they won't be questioned about, let me see your papers and are you here, Ill, are you here legally or illegally? Um, Continuing on with MPD. So MPD does send fingerprints of arrestees to the FBI, and the FBI does share them with ICE, and then ICE may issue an order to arrest, to detain an arrestee. But MPD only has custody of people for a short period of time, like about four hours, so this would more than likely be received when the Department of Corrections or the U.S. Marshals actually has somebody. So then we move to the Department of Corrections. What does our sanctuary city policy mean and what doesn't it mean when someone's at DOC? Well, first I wanna say that uh, much of the federal focus about immigrants has been on very serious criminals. And in the district, the Federal Bureau of Prisons has all our convicted felons. So we don't have the most serious criminals here. And so federal BOP may take some of um, DC residents who committed felonies and they may go right into um, ICE proceedings. But we don't have those people in, um, we, don't, we don't house those people in our jail. So DOC, the way it cooperates and doesn't is that it notifies ICE 48 hours before someone is scheduled to be released. And then it's up to ICE, either they're there for the release or they're not there for the release. But DOC will not hold an inmate past his or her release date. And if a judge orders someone released, they are released immediately. We don't hold them to wait for ICE to come pick them up. Um, and so we believe that this, is, this comports with the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution and that it comports with 8 U.S.C. 1373, which was already discussed. So um, the, the, our mayor's order, so there's a lot of law that governs this, and I brought a little notebook just to kind of like show and tell. There are mayor's orders, there are policies from the Department of Corrections, there are MPD policies that spell all this out in a lot more detail. But Mayor's Order 2011-174 um, explicitly affirms compliance with 1373. Um, so let's think, let me, as I said, I wanna spell this out much more broadly than law enforcement because as I said, we are a sanctuary city here in the district. And so that means that when we are um, interacting with the public through our various agencies, we aren't questioning their immigration status to the extent we don't have to. Some federal, federally funded programs require that we sift out who's here legally and who's not for benefits sake, but we have a special purpose driver's license, so people, who, um, people can get a special purpose driver's license. Um, of course, under Plyler against Doe, everyone can go to public school, but here they can also get lunches and breakfasts, and they're no, nowhere segregated out in, at school. They can have special education programs and benefits. The kids ride free on Metro, regardless of immigration status. They get all the DC Head Start, DC Healthcare Alliance, and immigrant children's programs. We have a burial assistance program, special supplemental nutrition for women, infants, and children. STD and immigration clinics, even the River Smart Home program, 
HIV AIDS housing and supportive services, AIDS drug assistance, special milk program, prenatal infant and early child home visitation program, summer food program. So those are examples of the programs, and probably that's not even anywhere close to comprehensive, but I wanted to show that that stronger together ethos really permeates all our agencies. Um, and we have special liaison units at MPD with immigrant communities. Our MPD officers come to events where immigrants are likely to be and try to reassure them that they should report crime, should talk to them, should feel comfortable with MPD. And the mayor signaled her commitment to um, immigrants and a recognition that people are feeling very afraid now by putting $500,000 into an immigrant justice legal services grant program this year and money's on the street to some of our legal services providers to help immigrants with their asylum applications, converting green cards to citizenship, all kinds of visa applications. And she has money in the proposed budget for immigrant justice legal services as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Betsy. Um, so Chief Manger, can you take us from uh, the sort of executive angle focus on the discussion to your perspective from the pol you know, the police agency, the police and community policing angle. I'm happy to, Karen, and, and thank you all for being here. Um, I am, am not an attorney, so I am the diversity uh, in, on this panel. <laughs> um, but, but I have been a police officer for 40 years and, um, got, and, and actually wanted to, to take us back. A lot of these um, issues are, um, have really popped up in recent times because we had secure communities starting six, seven years ago, uh, which, which um, was a bit of a moving target for local law enforcement as we worked with DHS, uh, went to the priority enforcement program, which in my view and in the view of, of, of uh, large urban uh, police departments around this country was exactly the right balance that we were looking for in terms of, of focusing, focusing on um, uh, uh, individuals who had committed crimes, serious crimes in jurisdictions. And now we're moving back to secure communities too, which again, we're trying to sort of nail down exactly what that looks like. Um, this really started for local police, this, this issue really started to, to become a, um, a problem right after 9-11, when then Attorney General John Ashcroft decided to begin to put the civil administrative warrants for immigration violations into NCIC. NCIC is a national database that if I stop some guy in the middle of the night and uh, for anything, for running a stop sign, and while I'm writing him the ticket for running the stop sign, I can run his name and date of birth through NCIC and it will come back if he's got a warrant out for his arrest anywhere in the country. And, um, and I will tell you at, in, in all my experience as a cop that if you got a hit from NCIC, um, it was a 100% surety that you took that guy, you know, if you have probable cause to believe that that was the individual who, who you know, the warrant was for, you took him into custody. When we started getting these civil immigration warrants into NCIC, then it was a problem because I had cops saying, well, does this give me the authority to pick this, this individual up or not? And of course, the advice we got from our county attorneys and from our attorneys was, no, you really don't have, um, you can notify ICE that you've got this person, but you can't take them, in. it does not give you the authority to take them into custody. So now all of a sudden, you've got um, hits in NCIC that aren't actionable in terms of what the cops can do, and that was confusing for us. Um, the Major City Chiefs Association, which is an association of the largest police departments uh, in this country, um, took a position that we wanted those, those administrative warrants taken out of NCIC because it was confusing. So that's, that started um, back in 2003, 2004, as more and more of those warrants got into the system. Um, the, you know, I think, uh, actually all the panelists, that, um, but uh, certainly uh, Michelle had, did a great job at, at laying out the landscape, so I don't want to repeat what she said, but we do um, struggle with uh, I, I tell you from a police uh, chief's perspective, I've got elected officials who are, you know, standing on their soapbox saying, we are a sanctuary jurisdiction. I've got 
other, my boss, the county executive, who said, we're not a sanctuary jurisdiction. <laughs> um, I've got um, uh, municipalities within my jurisdiction that say they, uh, that have passed resolutions, passed um, uh, ordinances that, that say they are a, uh, a sanctuary jurisdiction, yet they send the people that they arrest to our county corrections. And I got news for you, we're not a sanctuary jurisdiction. We, in fact, I think that um, uh, Betsy uh, talked about it. Uh, very, uh, we have much the same policy as, as the district. That is, we do notify ICE about who's in our jail. We will, what they call us and say, hey, do you have Joe Smith in your jail? We'll tell them we got Joe Smith, and we will let them know when Joe's gonna be released. Um, a little bit, uh, maybe a little different that if a judge releases somebody, it takes two to four hours to be processed out of our jail. We will call, if we have a detainer, we'll call ICE and say, Joe's getting out, you know, the judge released him. If you can be here within a couple hours, you can have him. If they're not there, then Joe walks out. So um, the impact on local police is, is um, it's been tough. I mean, it's been a bit of a moving target for us as things change on the federal level. Um, but I, we've been pretty consistent in, in localities. We don't ask people about their immigration status. Um, we, we don't care about their immigration status. The fact is that if someone is the victim of a crime, they deserve everything that we can give them. Um, I, I, I don't need to tell a room full of attorneys that no matter what your documentation status is, if you are in the United States, the Constitution applies to you and you, all the protections uh, apply to you. Um, this, this notion that um, you know, folks that are, are here undocumented give up their right to be the victim of a crime is just, is just ridiculous. And, and it's maddening for those of us who, who are trying to uh, protect uh, folks from, uh, from being uh, victims of crime. Um, we do, the, the, new, the president's uh, executive orders brought a, a bit more um, urgency to defining what a sanctuary jurisdiction is because we now risk losing grant money. Um, if we, if we are determined to, to be a sanctuary jurisdiction. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to sit and speak one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with Secretary Kelly from DHS. I've spoken with the Attorney General at least four times about um, immigration issues. I will tell you that um, oftentimes what the Attorney General says, what Secretary Kelly says, what the President tweets, it's not on the same page. Right. And so we're trying to navigate through this. And, and, uh, but I will tell you that um, the Attorney General and, and, and the Secretary are, are trying to work with us and, and are listening to what our issues are. It remains to be seen where this, the dust is going to settle on this. And I hope it settles in a place where we can, um, in fact, um, work with our federal law enforcement partners, which we do every day, but, but not have to be the immigration police. That's where we want to end up because I think that's what's best for the safety of our jurisdictions. Um, we um, uh, the, uh, we had a case in, the, in this this notion about the name and shame game, and I know that my uh, my uh, colleagues at ICE uh, don't like it when I use that term, but in fact that's exactly what this is. Um, for they for a couple of weeks they put out a report that was fraught with inaccuracies. Uh, it was brought to their attention. They've since suspended that report. I don't think it's um, come out uh, since, uh, at least for about a month or so. Um, but we, had a we in Montgomery County had a case recently where an individual who had um, uh, broken into a car, stolen guns, um, and was caught with a stolen car with those stolen guns, 18-year-old uh, young man arrested, um, he, in fact, uh, had a detainer placed on him because he was undocumented, and um, he was released by the judge. Uh, that's a whole other issue, how you get somebody who steals guns and release, release them, but that's a whole separate panel. Um, but uh, they, um, uh, he, and the, the, he was able to, to get out. There was a detainer on file. It was a mistake. Um, our corrections department made a mistake by releasing him, not notifying ICE, but it ha we were just taken by surprise that the judge would release him. ICE, from the Baltimore field office, issued a press release um, saying that, that Montgomery County did not honor their detainer and that, um, th that the public safety uh, of, of the, our community was impacted because this dangerous person was allowed to walk out because Montgomery County did not honor this detainer. Um, now, I'll, I'll finish up by saying that I've had the opportunity to work with, with Tom Homan, who was the um, acting director of ICE. And Tom Homan is a career ICE guy. He is a straight shooter, and, um, and I have a great deal of respect for him. 
And I think that he's going to try and, and he understands that there's, no, that there's nothing of value that comes out of those kinds of press releases. I, I you know, I, I um, uh, we, we've honored a number of detainers uh, for ICE, notified them someone was being released and ICE didn't show up in years past. Dozens of times ICE didn't show up. Do the, should we be releasing these press releases saying, hey, we, we, we held some guy, ICE didn't show up, so we had to release them? I, there's no value in that. And so I, I think that we're heading down the wrong path with this name and shame strategy. So I hope that that, that goes away. I, I'll just finish up by saying that, um, that um, Director Homan has assured me, and I believe him, that they understand their sensitive locations, hospitals, schools, churches, um, courthouses, that they are not doing random sweeps. They will not target people at those locations. However, in courthouses, they, he has said that if we uh, have an individual that we're looking for and we, we have no other way of finding them, but we know they're going to be in court, yes, we will go to that courthouse and wait for them. Um, they are not just going and hanging out in courthouses. And I'm not defending ICE. This is what they're telling me. And every case that we've had in my jurisdiction has been, yes, we had a warrant for that guy, and yes, we were there waiting for him. It was not just, hey, let's go hang out at the courthouse, see who we can pick up. Um, so, but it's, there's certainly um, been enough media coverage, and, I will, and I'll finish by saying this, and I'm not here to defend ICE, but I, I, I'll tell you as, from a law enforcement perspective, ICE has been vilified more than any law enforcement agency in this country over the last 10 years. People, there are a lot of people in this country that don't like what they do and have no res uh, thus have no respect for their mission no respect for, the, for the, the people that do that work. And um, the fact that, the pres that we have a president who was elected who set, went out and specifically talked to ICE agents and says, I got your back. Now, if there's been some backlash because they feel emboldened now to be able to finally, the, the shackles are off, we can go do our job, I think that dust will settle. ICE, I am convinced, is focusing on people who commit crimes. But every day we read about, say, well, ICE locked up this many people who, were, who, had been committed, who had committed crimes. But they also picked up this many that hadn't. And what Tom Homan said, and this is what we have to, we have to understand, um, is that he says, yes, we are still focused on picking up criminals. He said, but nobody's off the table. And the fact is, that's a reality. And that's the prerogative of this president of this administration. The same way it was the prerogative of the previous administration to say, we're going to focus on people who have been convicted of crimes. And there's folks that like that better, that sort of you know, meshed with their, uh, in, with their uh, uh, own political views, and, and they like that. The fact is that ICE has got a mission. We have to respect that mission. And uh, my hope is that we can work so, uh, so that we can maintain the trust and confidence of the public. And ICE has got to maintain the trust and confidence of the public the same way we do. And you do that by um, making sure that the public understands, understands what you're doing, that you're transparent about it, and that you're balanced and, and find that right balance of protecting your community, getting dangerous people out of your, off your streets, um, and, and, and focusing on the right, your resources on the right people. I can't speak for ICE, I won't speak for ICE, but I will tell you that that's our, we've tried to find that right balance. We've been accused of being a sanctuary jurisdiction because we don't ask people about their immigration status, and, um, but the fact is that we do cooperate with ICE the same way we cooperate, cooperate with DEA, FBI, ATF, and every other federal law enforcement agency. So we can find the right balance, we can do what's best for the safety of, of our nation, um, but uh, uh, you know, We've got to understand that there are going to be some folks that like what we do and some folks that don't. And we've got to try and navigate this in, in the, in the, with the most integrity, ethics, and the right priorities so that, that we do maintain the trust and confidence of the people we serve. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chief. Um, we are going to let uh, ICE speak directly for themselves in a moment, but I'm going to turn first to Chad for the DOJ perspective on the sanctuary concept and sanctuary city issues. Well, great. Thank you so much, and thank you to the ABA Commission on Immigration and the ABA Section on Civil Rights and Social Justice for bringing us here to talk about this important topic. Um, and thank you, Chief, for your remarks. We really appreciated that. And as you know, the, the Attorney General is committed to working with our state and local police um, in order to make our community safe. In one of his most famous dissents, Justice Scalia quipped, we have a government of laws and not of men. Of course, this principle existed long before Justice Scalia put pen to paper in Morrison v. Olson. It's foundational to our republic. 
And although Justice Scalia's dissent focused on the horizontal allocation of power between the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branches, this principle of a government of laws and not of men, the principle that the rule of law reigns in this country, is highly relevant when we talk about the vertical allocation of power between federal government and the states. At the heart of the debate over sanctuary cities is disagreement over whether an alien who is in this country illegally and who has violated our criminal laws should be deported. I think the answer, I think the law answers that question. 8 USC 1227, any alien shall be removed if the alien was inadmissible at the time of entry, is present in the United States in violation of our immigration laws, or has committed certain enumerated crimes. The law is plain, and the Attorney General plainly intends to do what he can to enforce it. So what can a state do when the state disagrees with the law and disagrees with the Attorney General's enforcement priorities? Well, first, let me start with what a state cannot do. A jurisdiction, a state or local jurisdiction, cannot set its own immigration priorities. According to Benjamin Johnson, the executive director of the American, American Immigration Council, quote, the federal government and only the federal government has the power and authority to set the nation's immigration policies. Mr. Johnson, when he was, gave that quote in reference to the Arizona case, clearly understood that it is the federal government and not state and local jurisdictions that are charged with establishing a uniform rule of naturalization. Mr. Johnson also clearly understood that the federal government not state and local governments, is charged with controlling and conducting foreign relations when he stated that the Department of Justice must, quote, seek to define and protect the federal government's constitutional authority to manage immigration. Well, Mr. Johnson, on that point, we do agree. And yet, jurisdiction after jurisdiction determines, based on its own priorities, not ICE's priorities, not the department's priorities, when it is going to hand over an alien to be deported. Some jurisdictions hand over criminal aliens that are in the country unlawfully regardless of their offense. Others only hand over those, those that in the jurisdiction's own view threaten public safety. The predictable result of this a la carte approach to immigration enforcement is a patchwork of conflicting mandates which predictably undermines the federal government's ability to enforce this nation's immigration laws. This threat is not hypothetical. For example, in February, under policies set by New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio, New York City released a known MS-13 gang member from Rikers, despite the fact that ICE had lodged a detainer against him. Because he was not, in New York City's view, in the mayor's view, he was not, quote, a threat to public safety. Well, as we know, in April, MS-13 brutally murdered four young men on Long Island just a couple days ago, I got a letter from legislators in Long Island asking the Attorney General to take all necessary action to ensure that illegal immigrants convicted of certain crimes are immediately designated for deportation. This is from the legislators in Suffolk County in Long Island. So here, New York City's actions are directly impacting their neighbors in Long Island. And according to Bill de Blasio, there is nothing the federal government can do about it. He is wrong. There is a reason why the Constitution takes the choice over immigration out of the hands of state and locals and puts it exclusively in the hands of the federal government. On this point, again, the American Immigration Council is spot on. Quote, the federal government must assert its authority to establish a uniform immigration policy that it can be held accountable for. In the current environment, it is unclear who is responsible for setting immigration enforcement priorities and who is responsible for their success or failure. Now there's a couple of points that some of my panel members raised that I just would like to respond to. First again, I would like to echo what the Chief said. The Department of Justice and the Attorney General is committed to working with our state and local authorities to adopt a common sense approach to solving the immigration problem in this country. Contrary to what might be said, or alleged, the Attorney General has never once suggested, the Department has never suggested, that police departments should detain or arrest victims, that the police department should detain or arrest those who report crimes. The Department of Justice agrees wholeheartedly with the Chief that the Constitution applies to all those in this country. 
So the question is, what does the Constitution require and what does it permit? It permits the Department of Justice and ICE to identify particular targets for immigration uh, enforcement priorities. And that's, in this case, those are people who are here in the country illegally, and these are people who have committed crimes. The way we communicate that, the way ICE communicates that, and I'll let Tracy go into that a little bit more, is through issuing a detainer request. Now a detainer request does two things. These are things that have not yet been talked about, but two very important things. First, a detainer asks the jurisdiction to notify ICE ahead of time with enough advance notice that ICE can get there in order to pick somebody up. I'm, I was very glad to hear that that is a practice that DC, in fact, does. I'm very glad to hear that's a practice that the chief um, in his county do as well, because that is crucial and that is important. The second thing that the ICE detainer does is asks, in cir circumstances where ICE cannot get there 20, uh, with enough time to pick someone up immediately after they're deported, to hold someone for 48 hours. Now, if all jurisdictions adopted the same policies as DC and the county of Montgomery, then I think we would be in a much better place. If all jurisdictions said, we will notify you ahead of time, 48 hours ahead of time, so that you can pick this person up, but we just don't want to hold that person for a, a minute longer than is required, I think we would all be in a better place. But sadly, that is not the policy of all counties. There are a lot of counties, including Cook County, including certain counties in California, including counties in Washington and Oregon State, that don't notify ICE at all. The second thing I want to point out is the legal authority for detainers. And again, I think Tracy is going to talk about this more, but one thing I want to point out is that it says right here, 8 U.S.C. 1226, on a warrant issued by the Attorney General, an alien may be arrested and detained pending a decision on whether the alien is to be removed from the United States. There's been a lot of question about when the United States has legal authority to detain a criminal alien. The answer is, with an administrative warrant, they're allowed to detain somebody pending that decision. Now, one of my panel members mentioned Moreno. Moreno is a case in the Northern District of Illinois that in fact held that warrantless arrests were improper in that instance. The decision had nothing to do with arrest space on an administrative warrant. And that's clear because, again, 8 U.S.C. 1226 clearly says that on a warrant issued by the Attorney General, an alien may be arrested and detained. ICE has a new policy, again, which I imagine Tracy will get into, but all of its detainers are now accompanied by administrative warrants. So that remedies any potential problem, and that puts us squarely within 8 U.S.C. 1226. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, Tracy, we'll turn to you now. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Karen. Um, I'd like to first thank um, the uh, Section on Civil Rights and Social Justice for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here today, as well as uh, the National uh, Press Club hosting this, and my distinguished panel members. And uh, thank you, Karen, for moderating this very important topic. Um, let me first say that since its creation in the aftermath of the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks, the mission of the Department of Homeland Security has been to prevent terrorism and to ensure the safety and security of Americans in the homeland. Now, as a component of the department, ICE, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, has a similarly critical mission, and that is to promote homeland security and public safety through the criminal and civil enforcement of our immigration, customs, and trade laws. Now, sanctuary cities are, are generally those jurisdictions that in some way prohibit, uh, through official action or practice, uh, their law enforcement officers from cooperating with ICE in the enforcement of the immigration laws. And I would submit to you that rather than promoting uh, public safety, these policies and practice in, in practices, in fact, uh, endanger the public. And I can give you a, a very real example. Um, in the past, uh, the former Immigration and Naturalization Service, which is the predecessor to ICE and ICE, had very good working relationships with state and local law enforcement agencies. And in that context, we would cooperate and collaborate with regard to the sharing of information regarding individuals 
that would be removable aliens uh, from the United States. That is to say, if there's some indication that an alien is removable, whether on a criminal basis or simply removable on another basis, we would share information with these law enforcement agencies. Um, so what we would have is, is these agencies would actually allow ICE and the INS to enter these facilities and um, actually interview these individuals to determine if they are in fact removable aliens. Uh, they would also communicate, pick up the phone, call ICE uh, when they had some reason to believe that there was someone in their custody that had been arrested for a state criminal offense. They would let us know, we, we may have someone in our custody who may be subject <coughs> to removal. You may interview them. You can come to the jail and interview them at, you know, at, at your leisure. But, but keep in mind, these are individuals that the state and local officials had arrested for state and local crimes across the spectrum from murder, rape, um, child exploitation, down to driving while intoxicated, and down to uh, other offenses, assaults, and so forth. So across the spectrum. So ICE in the INS in, in, in the earlier days would have an opportunity to engage, to, to discuss, to share information about these, come and interview the individuals, and through interoperability, uh, we, would, we would have some indication that these individuals may be removable from the United States under the Immigration Nat uh, Nationality Act. So, fast forward uh, to today. What we have are the rise of sanctuary jurisdictions that will prohibit ICE uh, from entering their, their jails. They will prohibit their officers and agents from communicating with ICE about the presence of individuals who may be subject to removal from the United States. And again, these are significantly uh, high-risk criminal aliens. So, what we have here is that ICE is no longer welcome in these jails, so they can no longer affect the arrest of these criminal aliens who are public safety threats in the safety and security of public facilities like jails or county detentions or state penitentiaries. So the, the sheriffs and the chiefs of police and the wardens of these facilities that we used to interact with uh, on, on a very collegial and close basis we, they've essentially shut off our access. So, so what does that mean for ICE? What it means is that ICE is going to continue to enforce the immigration laws. We're, we're simply not going away. So we, we, that's, our, that's our mission, is to enforce the immigration laws, both civil and criminal, to protect and promote public safety. So that forces the ICE agents and officers out onto the streets to arrest these individuals in targeted enforcement actions so let me be clear, ICE does not, as the chief uh, rightly pointed out, ICE does not conduct raids, ICE does not conduct sweeps, or any other indiscriminate form of uh, arrest practice. These individuals are targeted because we have some indication that they have been in state and local facilities for a criminal violation or a criminal arrest. However, once they're released and the, these agencies and uh, jurisdictions don't notify us, we, we have to target them individually. So, our agents and officers undertake investigation, we review uh, the file, and we target these individuals, which means we have to go out into the neighborhoods, we have to go to their homes, potentially to their businesses, or in other public areas to affect the arrest, as opposed to the safety and security uh, of a jail facility, which is uh, certainly the most appropriate place when these individuals have already been screened, they, are no long, they cannot have access to a weapon. They can't flee. So it's, a, it's, it's an orderly uh, transfer of custody. So again, the chief points out, and rightly so, that we're going to conduct our mission. It just means that we're going to be out in the neighborhoods where people don't want us to be, in the neighborhoods targeting these individuals at their homes, uh, again, in their businesses, and out in public areas. So we, so we would prefer this other, this other transfer of custody and, and as the chief points out, we are targeting criminal aliens, all right? This, that is our focus. But as he indicated also, the director of ICE has indicated that no aliens are off the table because under the Immigration Nationality Act, those who are simply here unlawfully are subject to removal from the United States, irrespective of any criminal history. So that means that if an ICE uh, agent or officer or team goes out and to identify as individuals at their home and they encounter them or if they encounter them in a public place, 
Um, if they also encounter those who are not criminals, but they are there with them, but also subject to removal under the Immigration Nationality Act, they will also be apprehended because they are here unlawfully for reasons, for reasons separate and apart for criminality. They are here unlawfully, and that's the President's directive under the executive orders that we shall take uh, enforcement action against all uh, removable aliens. So the point is, if you don't want those who are not criminals to be arrested, the idea is don't make us go to the homes or in public places or in other areas where we have to effect these arrests to, 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 to carry out our mission. Let's have it in a safe and secure jail environment where we can transfer custody for the officer's safety, for the alien's safety, and for public safety. So we, we would encourage greater cooperation, and I thank the chief uh, for, his, uh, you know, for his cooperation with ICE and, and those other jurisdictions that want to cooperate with ICE. We simply want to carry out the mission. It's no different, as he pointed out, from working with DEA, FBI, and other federal law enforcement agencies, or even state and locals. We have a mission, and, and, and the mission is to, for public safety. And I think we can all agree that public safety is the critical is the critical aspect here. We simply want to effect these arrests and seek removal of these aliens who are removable under the Immigration Nationality Act in a safe environment so that the public is, 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 is protected and not exposed to, to unnecessary risk. So I'll be happy to take questions and thank you so much. Um, thank you, Tracy. And now, um, Michael, I have the pleasure uh, with this long list of questions growing over here to punt it to you first and, and see, uh, uh, see how you're going to respond to the comments from the uh, whole table that preceded you. Yeah, I think uh, we've covered both sides of the spectrum here. And you know, my role here, and I want to thank uh, the ABA for uh, having me, inviting me to be part of the commission. Um, and also to have a forum like this where we can really exchange these ideas rather than just sort of talk in an echo chamber. Um, so I'd like to thank DOJ and ICE for also participating. Um, my background is I was the principal legal advisor. I, I was in Tracy's seat in the uh, Bush administration. Frankly, when, when secure communities and this information sharing really was developed, um, and I think to some extent, you know, it made sense post 9-11 where there was a real concern, security concerns on who is here, what the status, and do we have a handle on our immigration enforcement. That was a priority, and it was something that we were charged with. How are we going to more effectively enforce those immigration laws that have always been on the books? Um, and so the idea of having technology work together and being able to share information from the states and locals, police departments, FBI, and U.S. visit, which was now capturing all sorts of information on individuals who were in the country in an immigration immigrant status, um, was a good idea that made sense. I think, to some extent, it created something that we really had didn't anticipate. Uh, we, you know, one of the panelists mentioned the numbers and how we were identifying so many more individuals who were in state and local jails now automatically as having. Maybe they, had a, uh, they were here unlawfully, they may have been removed previously, what have you, and now we had access and we had that information. And we really struggled and worked with state and locals very closely to come up with now what are we gonna do with that? How are we gonna rationally implement that process? And frankly, D.C. and Montgomery County during those years were great friends working with how can we do that? Now, one of the concerns, and I think this is what Tracy and Chad were mentioning, um, with the whole sanctuary talk is, is the pendulum gonna go so far the other way that state and locals are gonna say, we're gonna shut off any information sharing whatsoever? And I recall when I was, work, when I was in, we're in, that, that, in that ICE position, that was a huge concern. Are, we going, are, are individuals who are either a national security concern criminal, gang member, what have you, are they going to be released and we're not even going to know about it? So it's that real information sharing. Now on the flip side, there are real issues about, you know, what's our authority as a state and local? Can we hold this person beyond the time that we're going to release them? Those are real issues and I think that, you know, that's where coordination, communication between state and locals needs to be increased rather than just drawing these bright lines because I think that's, going to, that's, that's not the solution here. Um, you know, one, one from my private practice hat, there's uh, some of the frustrations that I've seen, um, frankly, with the system is 
now that we're identifying individuals uh, more efficiently, now that we're placing more people than ever into this immigration court process, that's not working. And so we have, cl I have clients that are sitting there, you know, they're not getting a court date for years and years and years. Some of these folks are being detained by ICE, not for years and years and years, that we've been able, to, we're getting quicker court dates on that. But even in the non-detained docket where these people have to go on and live their life, these, there, are, there really are sympathetic stories out there. These folks have families um, that are have US citizens. They need their day in court. I think on both sides, everybody recognizes that these folks have to be provided with a timely hearing where they, a judge can decide, is there relief or, or do they need to be removed? And ICE needs to be, be able to make their decisions prioritizing those folks in light of the resources. But if the system is so broken that we're not even getting court dates for, you know, individual calendars are not being set for four years from a master calendar, there's just something wrong. And so I think we have to, we're talking about the front end of the system. Our individuals who are being identified by state and local is gonna be turned over to ICE and get the process started. But we've gotta remember that there's a long process and we need to make sure that that is that's also working. So that, that's all the comments I wanted to make, and I think the roundtable discussion is really the interesting part anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Michael. Thanks very much. I'm going to start sort of on your last point right there about the immigration court backlogs and the, you know, often years delay even for a master calendar hearing. But e even if we think about it in the detained context, the lengthy amount of time it can take um, to a merits. What's your solution for that? Not, not in an abstract context, but when we're talking about this issue of detainers, um, communications with federal authorities, and more people coming into the system. I imagine that part of your point is the immigration court system is getting clogged with cases where um, some may be serious criminal offenders, some may not, but at the end of the day, people across a variety of um, uh, contexts are having a delay in having their case heard. Whether it's a criminal deportation, uh, you know, a criminal conviction type deportation or an asylum seeker or whatever, more cases coming in means a delay in getting to your ultimate hearing. So how does the question of detainers and cooperation play into that from your point of view? Well, I think that the sooner that ICE um, can know about an individual, know when they're going to be released, and then be able to decide, you know, is this a priority? And that, those priorities, Frank, as the chief said, those priorities changed. Um, you know, it's broader now than it was oh, in, the, in the past several years. That's, you know, there's a rational basis for that. But there still has to be, a, I think it would be very helpful if, you know, the attorneys got involved in this case earlier, Everybody could make a decision. Is there relief that's available? Is there some way that we could speed this process along? Can we vet through some of these issues um, so that we can more efficiently resolve whether this person should be give, granted relief? Maybe not, you know, continue with the case if, there, if, if for whatever reason there's not a valid case there or, or it meets the discretionary requirements now. Um, or if they are going to be removed, if there's, you know, a way to move that case along in the system. Resources, it's not going to happen without resources. But resources do make a difference. And, you know, I've seen, a lot of this is anecdotal, but we know that there have been um, several new immigration judges that have been placed in various locations. And I've heard, anecdotally at least, you know, hey, in Miami, we're starting to see individual cases being scheduled and merits hearing being scheduled much quicker than they were in the past you know, three years ago, that's a good thing. And so you sometimes look at the numbers and you think there's never gonna be an answer. We're so in the hole that boy, unless we get 300 more judges, we're not gonna be able to, or we move to something like expedited removal across the board, we're not gonna be able to plot, get through this. But we've seen that even, you know, a smaller number of IJs being dedicated in, in select locations can have a huge impact. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that, um, that's going to put me to you, Tracy, and maybe to Chad. On the backlog question and the, um, the call for sort of uh, attorney early involvement, early look at priorities, who do we really want to remove? At least my understanding of the current executive orders and some of what you mentioned in your remarks is that everybody's a priority if they 
come to the attention of ICE if they fall within the net, whether in a targeted action or by accident in, a, in the context of apprehending someone else. So how do you respond then to the suggestion that um, there has to be prioritization, resources have to come into play when we're talking about um, all the people who may be subject to detainers or about whom ICE may receive notification? Uh, thank you, Karen. Um, Essentially, you know, the President's executive orders are clear that those who are subject to removal from the United States are, are as, I, as we said earlier, on, still on the table. The, the point I'm making is that um, we are no longer going to categorically take out of the enforcement realm classes of aliens that meet certain categories. Uh, and, 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 publish those categories. What we're saying is that under the Immigration and Nationality Act, aliens who are here unlawfully, who are unlawfully present uh, under Section 212 of the uh, INA, and those who have come here and overstayed or are otherwise subject to deportation, uh, generally under Section 237 of the Act, are now subject to removal. So we will internally determine, you know, our priorities and utilize our resources in the best way that we can. First, as I indicated earlier, uh, one of our clearest uh, missions is public safety. So we are obviously going to target criminal aliens first. Uh, in addition to you know those who would uh, those who would threaten the national security, they may or may not be criminals. There may be some intelligence on those individuals, but nonetheless, we are going to target. Those who, are, uh, those who are threats to national security and those who are threats to public safety. So with, with, within those parameters, we are going to go after those, clearly, who have the most egregious criminal offenses because they're, um, you know, they're the ones that are more easily identified uh, through the process. When, when the chiefs, uh, police officers apprehend somebody um, you know, on a felony charge, uh, there's a reason why we have grades of criminal offenses. We have felonies and misdemeanors. So we, we naturally look at those who are the most uh, significant threat to public safety. We'll target those individuals, mostly the felons, those who also commit uh, assaults. Those are misdemeanor, generally misdemeanor offenses, but nevertheless, they, they, are, they are offenses against the person. And so um, these, are, these are situations where what we want to do is prioritize our resources and and our assets to target those individuals that we can we can make the most the ease the greatest impact on public safety as quickly as possible. Now, does that mean we are we are going to not uh, target those who are you know who have driven without a license or those who have uh, you know uh, a DUI arrest or something like that? No, we will. If 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 we encounter those individuals, we will take action against them because they are subject to removal from the United States. So. Um, you know, and, and to, to Michael's point, yes, there is a massive backlog, and so we have to be mindful uh, of that backlog. Do we want to place somebody, uh, a relatively low priority alien, uh, in proceedings that will, you know, uh, extend for many years and so forth that may or may not uh, result in a removal, or removal order or they have some sort of relief from removal? Uh, typically, criminal aliens have fewer opportunities for relief. Uh, that is certainly so for aggravated felons. Uh, under Section 101 of the, of the Act, but also certain other egregious offenders. So we are going to target those that have the greatest impact, that will make, uh, you know, Americans safer, and that, you know, align with the idea that, you know, again, we are not indiscriminately rounding people up, checking their documentation. If we encounter them, and it's typically in, in the context of a criminal uh, or, or a civil enforcement action, that's when we will apprehend them and move forward with their removal. Um, so, so we, we do prioritize, but, but we do have, you know, we don't, we're not going to tell uh, the American public, here's a schedule of offenses. If you fall within them, uh, we will target you. If you fall without them, uh, we will not. We, we don't do that because, again, there may be circumstances that warrant uh, an arrest of an individual and seeking removal of them that they don't quite fit, fall, fall within certain uh, parameters. And one quick follow up on that. Do I understand correctly when you're talking about um, targeting for enforcement that that means actually arrest and issuance of an NTA or are you also talking about actually pursuing the case in removal proceedings after that phase? Um, yes. Well, I mean, 
when we arrest, uh, make a civil arrest, obviously our purpose is to seek the alien's removal from the United States. So, um, but keep in mind, uh, a, a, an arrest of an alien who has been um, previously removed May, may lend itself to a criminal prosecution for illegal reentry, and there, there are other bases for criminal prosecution. Um, but generally speaking, if we are, uh, in, we are enforcing the civil immigration laws, yes, we are targeting the individuals for removal from the United States, either through the issue, which will result either in the issuance of a notice to appear or some other charging document that will initiate their removal uh, proceedings. That is to say, sometimes there are administrative, uh, under Section 238 of the Act, there's an administrative removal proceeding that does not uh, require a, a proceeding before an immigration judge. So whatever uh, statutory authorities we have, we're gonna take full, uh, we're gonna take uh, all of our, all of our, utilize all of our authorities to, to initiate removal proceedings and actually affect the removal of these individuals through whatever proceeding is available. And Karen, if I can make yes, one point Chad, on the, sure. the backlog. So the Attorney General has taken a lot of steps to help reduce the backlog. We realize it's a problem. We realize it's a real problem. Everybody deserves their day in court. So what are we doing? We're streamlining, we're streamlining the immigration judge hiring process. Previously, it took one year to fill one position. We're trying to shorten that amount of time because we have open spots and we need to get people in there. We're placing new judges in high priority areas. Again, trying to hire new judges. We're conducting removal proceedings in jail. Now this is key because at our BOP facilities where an immigrant, a legal immigrant is in the facility, we can actually conduct the removal proceedings while this person is serving their time. So as soon as their time is done, that person can be removed from the country. We would love to work with state and locals and, and do something very similar in state and local detention facilities. So if someone is serving their time as opposed to then getting out, having to go into an ICE detention center where we'll initiate a removal proceeding, if they would allow us to come in, bring our immigration judges in, and uh, uh, conduct a hearing while in the jail, that would help streamline the process. We're also doing video conferencing hearings, um, trying to get to a place where we can use judges all over the country to hear cases in particularly high priority areas. So maybe we can't get a judge from Michigan to go down to the southern border, but we can put up a camera in the southern border so an immigration judge in Michigan can hear all of the cases. And so we are actively trying to help reduce the backlog for the purpose that Michael mentioned, to give people their day in court. Um, and I wanted to, Chad, um, while you have the floor, I wanted to ask a couple of definitional questions. Sure. When um, you say, and I think you mentioned right now, about illegal aliens having their hearings while they're in proceedings, what do you mean when you say that? If the, if the, do you mean people who have criminal convictions or undocumented people? Because I think you're talking about people who haven't had removal proceedings yet. So I'm trying to understand the reference to illegal aliens. Right, thank you for asking that. And so whenever we're conducting these removal proceedings, you're right, these are people who are suspected to be um, removable from the country, um, either under 8 USC uh, 1227 or some other provision of the immigration laws. Um, some of these are people who have committed other criminal offenses in the United States. That's why they're in BOP custody or either state and local custody, and obviously those people are a priority for the administration. Um, but that's sort of, you know, what, what I meant whenever I said that. Okay, thanks. And I had one other question similarly um, when you were talking about the detainers. And um, uh, sorry, I don't have the exact language now, but it was something about uh, criminal aliens, detainers in the context of criminal aliens, but I think when you were discussing it, some of it was um, pre-adjudication, people who may have come into the system on a criminal charge. Is right. that, when you were saying criminal aliens, did you mean to say people who were charged with crimes or adjudicated or even had come into the system and maybe had charges dismissed? So we would say people who have been both charged and convicted with crimes. Okay. Um, I'm gonna take a break to look for my next question and invite anybody else on the panel who'd like to respond to any of these points before we get off of uh, these topics yeah, altogether. Karen, if you don't mind, I, I'll just echo Chad's uh, comments as it relates to criminal aliens. You know, we, we, we look at criminal aliens as those who are charged with a criminal offense, those who are convicted of a criminal offense. At the end of the day, it, again, if they were, if they are removable from the United States by virtue of their illegal presence here, um, 
then they are then we will seek their removal and if we encounter them through the through through our uh, interacting with them through the criminal justice process that is to say engaging with them through the jails or in the prisons um, then we will if we deem them you know a public safety threat we will take action against them notwithstanding a, the, the lack of a criminal conviction so for example um, there are statistics that suggest that you know those who drink and drive have uh, who have been engaged in the, that, that type of conduct many times before they're actually arrested. So the fact that someone's arrested for a driving while intoxicated or DUI um, and they are not convicted does not suggest that they are not a public safety threat. Um, so we look at those aliens uh, who are subject to removal but also at, as a public safety threat when we take enforcement action against them. Now, there are many, many aliens who already have criminal convictions that are separately removable on those bases, but nevertheless, uh, under the, the uh, Immigration Nationality Act, under Section 212, if they are here unlawfully, um, then we can take that action against them and we gauge their uh, public safety threat at that time. Now, mind you, there are aliens who are here on, on unlawful, unlawful status. So clearly, a lawful permanent resident, right, who is uh, arrested for a, a drive uh, for driving while intoxicated or otherwise, that individual is not subject to removal from the United States. We, we do not take enforcement action against those individuals um, because that would require a separate basis for removability. But generally speaking, those who are here unlawfully have no status, um, and we determine that they are a public safety threat. We will take uh, enforcement action against them, as I alluded to earlier. Karen, I just want to jump in on one thing, but. In, a, in some number of those cases, especially if this person's been here for a, a significant number of time, may have United States born children, what have you, they may have some relief. Yes. And if we can get that case into the system and moved through the system, and also potentially talk with an ICE attorney who's, you know, on an individual case by case basis can make some decisions about whether or not this is a good case for that sort of relief and we can get it to a judge quickly, then that person doesn't stay in limbo, potentially detained for some extra period of time or what have you, and then we can regularize whatever the status is, but under the current law, that person now can reside here legally. And so if we can, if the back end's not working, then it just clogs everything up, and this person is now really just walking around with no, with, with no ability to work, and other, you know, negative mm -hmm. consequences. And I'm not sure, but it sounds like you may be speaking primarily about cancellation of removal, where the only opportunity for that form of relief is before an IJ. Correct. Unlike some of the other forms of relief that may be available administratively if Correct. the person is not in proceedings. Or adjustment. Well, yeah, right. And, right, and so if we can get that person relief before being placed in removal as well, those are other options that this, you have to look at this holistically. It's not just one piece of the immigration system. Okay. It looks like we have a couple of comments yeah, here. I mean, I think my, my deepest concern is the steps that are going to be taken by the Department of Justice, since we're talking about procedural protections in immigration cases, where it doesn't really look like they're streamlining, but more like railroading. Uh, people through a process where you're taking away immigration procedural protections. For example, if people do have relief, um, you know, I think there's an understanding out there and might be eligible for a visa that there will not be any continuances, right, that are granted for people who might be eligible for a visa married to a U.S. citizen, a victim of a crime. Those people will not be able to actually pursue immigration relief um, because, because you know, I think the, the Department of Justice has changed their position on how they're gonna allow those cases to proceed. So on one end, streamlining a case, but at the same time, taking away some of the remedies that used to be available to attorneys is a really kind of tough pill to swallow for advocates who have been working with communities for decades, trying to ensure that families stay together. Um, that's one, I think that's one comment I have. The second comment that I have, I think, is that it's, it's um, worrisome to me that people who are, you know, where there's no uh, finding, there's no kind of, uh, of, of dangerousness, let's say. I mean, that's like a poor term to use, but that people who are charged with crimes are now being cast as being convicted of one. And I think that is not an issue of law, actually. That's an issue of rhetoric. 
um, because how we fall down on that question is really going to impact the rights of the people in those proceedings. Because as you know, um, you know, most immigration relief is discretionary. It is in the hands of the immigration court. It is in often the hands of the trial attorney who can agree or not, right, to decide whether they're going to join in on relief. And, and you know, for, as for the many years that all of us have practiced, um, it, is, it is just, these are difficult laws. Um, they, are, they are really harsh laws that have been on the books for 20 years and have, frankly, allowed 400,000 people to be deported every year. Um, so the question to me is, as we talk about deportations and immigration cases, do you want to expand the 400,000 per year even higher? Is that the goal? Is it a numbers game? Or is it a game to actually protect the rights of the people who are in proceedings at the time? Because I'm not really sure where we're falling on that. I'm happy to respond. Uh, um, let me hear from Michelle, to Michelle too, and then okay. maybe you can respond to both. Yeah, I think that this question follows. Um, that Following on Paramita's question, this idea that being arrested for a crime or being charged with a crime is um, considered you know, the same as having a conviction and that, that they are seen as threats to public safety for that arrest. And I'm wondering if that then would incentivize certain police who want to play a larger role in deportations to arrest people who they believe look or sound like immigrants um, to get them into the system, to arrest them and charge them with a crime, knowing that even if there's no conviction, that ICE will still be um, initiating deportations against that person as a public safety threat. So since that point goes to incentivizing police, let me call on Tom, if I may, and then back down to Tracy and Chad. Yeah. Um, a false arrest is a false arrest. A, 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 um, and no, what, no matter what your motivation is, um, there are, there are um, large segments of our community, or I shouldn't say large, there are segments of our community that believe police are motivated by race, by ethnicity, um, immigration status. The fact is there are checks and balances in our, uh, in our um, criminal justice system that um, will f hopefully um, keep those kinds of arrests from progressing. Um, through the criminal justice system, um, and uh, if if this is, I, I don't believe that this is a, a huge issue. Do, does it happen? It happens occasionally, but that it's it's the same notion that um, that unfortunately that much of the American public is has been convinced by the press and social media that there's an epidemic of police violence in this country. Um, there's not. There's less use of force today than there has been historically by police. Police are better trained um, and, and use less force today than ever before in, in law enforcement history. Uh, but w because of what is, uh, you know, you, you only need uh, a few knuckleheaded policemen doing knuckleheaded things around this country um, to, to uh, convince folks that it's a, it's an, it's a big problem. So uh, it, it is not an issue, um, uh, it, I, th I believe, that, you've, that police are incentivized to arrest someone based on the way they look or the fact they might be undocumented. We have enough uh, real crime that we have to deal with and stay busy enough with, with um, uh, I, keeping the, the, the public safe. Um, I, I don't think that that is, is as big a concern as, as um, other folks might think. I think, if I understood, and I don't mean to speak for Michelle, but the point was um, taking your point that the criminal justice system will weed out the bad arrests from the criminal perspective. The problem is that people are then surfaced to ICE potentially and face removal mm -hmm. proceedings, and not in, not in your jurisdiction where people weigh carefully, right, whether arrests should be made and are rigorously trained and try to follow carefully the proper laws, that there are other jurisdictions in the country where um, people are not as careful about what they do from a criminal perspective, and the real, uh, that people are far more adversely affected or can be by removal proceedings than by whatever the criminal issue is for, even if the arrest is ultimately dismissed. Is that what you were trying to get at? Yes. Okay, so Tracy, and then I wanna shift gears a bit to Betsy and to Tom. 
Great. Uh, thank you. Um, let me just first respond to, to the comment as it relates to uh, is it a numbers game? Are we trying to get deportations to a certain level? That's absolutely not the case. This is all about public safety. Um, and we are simply uh, identifying threats to public safety and removing them from the United States. And so if, if the laws seem harsh, uh, then, then it's only because these laws uh, were enacted uh, basically part of the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996 during the Clinton administration. For 20 years, these laws have been on the books. And so the laws plainly stay, state that aliens present in the United States without inspection or admission are subject to removal from the United States. Nothing more is necessary. So do we, as, as I indicated earlier, we don't, we don't do sweeps, we don't do raids. We, we, we encounter individuals uh, during the course of, of, of targeted enforcement actions. So, you know, th there doesn't have to be uh, an arrest or even a conviction. The fact that someone is here and we, we are made aware of it through, for, through operations, then we can take enforcement action against them. And co Congress clearly stated that was the case. And Congress also built in these mechanisms, as Michael pointed out, for relief, adjustment of status, cancellation of removal. So under Section 212 of the Act, your mere presence subjects you to removal, that is sufficient. We, we, we need not say more. You know, again, we don't have the resources. We're not going out simply uh, randomly checking people for their papers. But the point is Congress built the, in the, the relief valve by allowing adjustment of status and other forms of relief to these individuals who are arrested and, and we're seeking their removal. So, so in the immigration context, we are first prosecutors. We initiate removal proceedings. And then once the alien is eligible for relief, then we, we shift our roles and then we litigate whether the alien is, is eligible for relief. So Congress said, under certain circumstances, if you've been here 10 years and you meet good moral character uh, uh, qualifications and you don't have certain offenses, you can stay. But, but Congress didn't, didn't put into the law, you know, if, if you just if, if there's no other basis uh, for removal, you can just stay here, or that criminal, criminal uh, basis for removal is required. No, Congress said, these individuals are subject to removal. Here's your relief valve. If you qualify, then you're eligible. Congress has made that decision for us. We don't need to engage in second guessing of them. So the point here is that, you know, we are simply enforcing the laws that have been on the books for 20 years. There's nothing new. Uh, we, we are going back to where the enforcement was prior to the last eight years, and so we're simply getting back uh, to the enforcement aspect of this. But I, but I also note, and I could not agree with the chief more, uh, he, he, he nailed, the, the, nailed it right on the head, you know, there, there is no indication that, that the enforcement of immigration laws is going gonna, is gonna to result in any more racial profiling than any other aspect of, of, of law enforcement. Um, I mean, if that were the case, you would see that in the context of drugs um, or violent crime, or any other manner of criminal enforcement of any other federal agencies. Why is it that suddenly ICE agents or people that, that cooperate with ICE, the chiefs, uh, police officers, or any, any deputies, would be any more predisposed to racial profiling in enforcing the immigration laws than any other laws? I mean, we, we know that many, many of the aliens that are in federal uh, custody in the Bureau of Prisons are, are, are doing time, hard time, for drug trafficking offenses and other, other serious offenses. So you would think maybe the DEA or other criminal or other criminal investigative agencies would be more targeting toward these you know individuals than than others, but but it's clearly not the case. There's no suggestion, there's no indication that they're any more predisposed to be you know racial profiling than any other in, in, than any other context because they have their careers, they have an internal review process, they can be prosecuted, and I know the chief probably is aware, you know, I don't know if there's ongoing investigations, not with his agency, but, but he, you know, he's made aware of situations that arise where that, that is, is arising, uh, arises because these individuals have uh, uh, the ability to, to allege their claims. They go through the process, through litigation. So that's going to be there, and there are going to be some bad apples, but by and large, there's no indication that any more racial profiling is going to go on in enforcement immigration laws. Okay. Um, thank you, Tracy. I want to come back to um, Betsy and Tom with a couple of more questions and then um, go to our promised Q&A here. Um, the thing that I wanted to ask um, Betsy and Tom from your respective jurisdictions and also from your uh, awareness of what's going on in um, other city, county, um, and state level jurisdictions, 
how do local entities decide about sanctuary city policies at all? Is it an executive decision, a legislative decision, um, litigation decision? How, how do entities come to and grapple with and actually decide on this question? Well, thank you, Karen. I can't speak for cities across the country, but the District of Columbia has both a mayor's order and there's legislation regarding sanctuary cities. And uh, then I think there's a communicative, communicative function that is an ongoing one from the mayor and how does, how does she and how do other officials interact with our communities. But I think you could see from Michelle's discussion and Tom's and mine that jurisdictions around the country interpret differently what it means to be a sanctuary city. And um, I hope that um, the Department of Justice and Homeland Security won't cut off grants um, to cities that are important for community policing and for domestic violence and for Homeland Security and other kinds of grants when cities are taking a very different approach case by case to understanding what makes their cities safer. And we came to our decision um, many years ago, and DC's crime rates have been, you know, trending downward by and large. And we feel like we're safer when um, when people feel like they have access to government services, and when they feel like they can come out and send their kids to school in safety, and when they feel like they can report crimes to police. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was a misunderstanding about us. I don't know if you were thinking. I said that you were arresting people who are victims of crime, but I do think there's, if people are very afraid that an interaction with the police will turn into um, a pr immigration proceeding, they'll be much less likely to report a crime because like in the domestic violence context, it's very common that if say a woman's beaten up and she reports it, the perpetrator may say, oh, well, she hit me first and you should arrest both of us. And then if she gets in the system, she would be very vulnerable. And so we're, we're thinking that we're safer and stronger together um, with this legal architecture of mayor's orders and departmental orders at MPD and DOC and legislation. And it's, it's very nuanced and complicated in a way that goes well beyond this term, sanctuary city. Okay, thank you. Um, now, we're running short on time, but Tom, I just want to ask you, you mentioned in Montgomery County that all the entities don't even agree on whether the county is or isn't a sanctuary jurisdiction. So can you say briefly who decides or, you know, across the spectrum, who do you think should decide? I can do it briefly. There are um, only re a relatively few jurisdictions around the country where the mayor stands up and says, we are a sanctuary jurisdiction, or the, or the, the city council will, will pass some resolution. It's actually very few, but they get a lot of attention. I mean, when it's Chicago or New York or San Francisco, it gets attention. The vast majority of jurisdictions, um, guide their, what guides their policy is legal decisions. We, we, the fact that we will not hold someone beyond the time when they would normally be released based on even if we have an ICE detainer, is not a political decision about this is what we're going to do. It's the legal guidance we have gotten from the Fourth Circuit that we have gotten from our own attorneys. And when my attorney says, you, can't, you should not hold this person, we, we are liable if you do, um, what, I have to follow my attorney's advice. It is a legal decision, not a political one. Thank you. And one um, point I want to come back to Paramitha. You alluded earlier to the California decision about the funding restriction and the constitutionality of that in the executive order. Can you take just a minute on what happened there so, um, and then we'll go to audience questions. Sure. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Just a minute. <laughs> um, well, the, um, through an executive order that was issued by, uh, by the Trump administration um, and actually, um, our, our, the Attorney General, um, there was essentially a threat that was made that there would be a withholding of federal funds from cities that they designate as sanctuary cities. Um, the argument is that these cities are violating a federal statute, 18 U.S.C. 1373, um, that addresses how police departments communicate with ICE. Um, you know, so first of all, many of these sanctuary, most of the, uh, nearly all of them, I think, almost all. Don't violate these, don't violate the statute. 
Um, and second, um, if you did actually um, try to make this happen, if you did try to take away federal funding, that actually it would violate the Constitution. And it, might, it would violate the Constitution because the Supreme Court has repeatedly ruled through a number of decisions, one around, uh, one called Prince, which is about um, how information should be shared um, amongst gun, gun owners and registration requirements for gun owners and through Sibelius, which was involving the ACA decision, that the federal government really can't commandeer state and local officials by compelling them to enforce federal law. Um, in last month, a US district court in San Francisco granted a temporary injunction of the sanctuary city section of that interior enforcement executive order, and it concluded that the EO, the executive order, likely constitution, constitutes unconstitutional commandeering because it coerced state and local governments to enforce federal law in violation of several Supreme Court precedents under the 10th Amendment, the ones that I just mentioned. Um, and, I, and I kind of wanted to maybe just end by reading, you know, um, this, and, and is, is the decision from the, the court is very short. But it said, at the hearing, the government counsel explained that the order is an example of the pre president's use of the bully pulpit and even if read narrowly to have no legal effect, serves the purpose of highlighting the president's focus on immigration enforcement. While the president is entitled to highlight his enforcement priorities, an executive order carries the force of law. And I think, you know, the reason why this judge felt compelled to respond was the actual imminent threat that this executive order posed, which was that it could force, coerce uh, localities um, into either Give, clawing back uh, money that was owed to Okay, the and I anticipate that the government speakers will want to address that point, and so um, I, ha I didn't say to the audience, but I said to them that I'm going to come back to each of them at the very end for a closing remark, so I invite you to hold on to that point if you do want to address that when I come back to you. So um, for the audience, we have the remaining time for questions and answers, and I'd like to remind people um, Seek to be recognized, identify yourself by name and organization, and then ask your question. And I want to encourage people, um, not speeches, not comments, please, but true questions for the panel. So I'll start right here in the front middle. Hi, I'm Lisa Sorden with the State and Local Legal Center. My question is for Paramita and Chad. Um, I'm wondering if there are any court decisions that say that uh, an administrative warrant signed by someone who works for ICE is, um, uh, meets the requirements of the Fourth Amendment. I think this issue um, hasn't really been decided, and uh, there's several courts that have questioned the validity of those administrative warrants that could be, that are supplementing the detainer form and, and have not yet decided whether they will meet the probable cause requirements. Chat. So I would just say that um, I don't think that there's necessarily any case law directly on point on that specific question. That case, that issue just got teed up in Texas where the state of Texas passed SB4, which would require Austin to honor immigration detainers, Travis County. I think Travis County tends to um, oppose that policy. And one of the arguments I anticipate that they'll raise is a Fourth Amendment argument. Texas filed a lawsuit seeking declaratory judgment that it is um, a, a warrant a detainer you know, accompanied by an administrative warrant is compatible with the Fourth Amendment. I don't think we've gotten an answer on that yet. Um, you know, there is this case, United States v. Watson, Supreme Court, 1976, talking about warrantless criminal arrests with respect to probable cause. Um, you know, and the basis there, I think that there are some principles that we can draw off on that. But essentially, when you have probable cause, when police have probable cause, the chief could probably speak to this more than I can, but we have always had a practice where a police officer can detain somebody based on probable cause that that person has committed a crime. The fact that we're dealing with, you know, a type of crime that is now disfavored among the federal government or among the population doesn't really change that legal analysis. And so it doesn't answer your question, you know, to answer your question, there is nothing right on point. I okay. suspect we'll get there, um, but I think we have some helpful precedents to draw off of. Okay, next question over here on the, my left. Yes, ma'am. Hi. 
I'm Tia Dewar from People Power DC. Um, we have been asking the um, director of the Department of Corrections in DC to review and make alterations in the recent directive that guides the way immigrant inmates, inmates are handled in DOC facilities. The people, as you mentioned, Michelle, people in those facilities are not the convicted felons. Uh, they generally are in those facilities for up to 21 days, sometimes a year, according to Director Booth. Uh, my question really is for Paramita and Michelle. Uh, we are pressing for the requirement that there be a court order to accompany requests for information about when a, an inmate would be released, uh, specific information on the sentencing of that inmate, access to the inmate for interview. Uh, and our understanding is requesting a court order does not in any way violate Section 1373. Paramitha or Michelle? <laughs> yeah, those are two separate trains. So um, there wouldn't be a violation of 1373 by requesting a magistrate's decision to, to have somebody interview. I mean, I would also probably pose that there are Miranda considerations that come out with, you know, interviews of, of inmates um, in detention for purposes of, con you know, moving into removal proceedings or even a federal prosecution. Mm -hmm. Can communication, it would just be a prerequisite for communication. Mm -hmm. Can I get a show of hands how many people have questions so I can decide how to allocate the time? Okay, um, quick, quick, let me, let me go here and try to be concise in the question and I'll ask the panel to try to be concise in the answer so we can take as many of these as possible. So there's a pending legislation in Congress, uh, Stop Dangerous city, uh, Sanctuary Cities, they're trying to extend liability protection. If you comply with a detainer, it makes your law enforcement officers, federal immigration officers, or federal agents. Isn't that commandeering? And would that be not subject to the 10th Amendment if that legislation this gets passed? Who'd like to take that one? Do you want to take it? Can I just respond to one thing? About the commandeering point, commandeering came up in the United States um, v. Prince, the case that Paramita mentioned. It is when the federal government requires a state to do something. So in that case, it was the Brady Handgun Prevention Act, I believe, that required state or local officials to conduct a background checks. There's another sort of Supreme Court case called uh, United States v. Dole. In that case, we conditioned, the federal government conditioned requiring a state to do something with attaching federal grants. In that specific instance, it was, we will give you transportation highway funds if you raise your drinking age to 21. The court was very clear, there's no commandeering problem when the state has a choice whether to comply or not comply. There might be a coercive problem, which is the NFIB case where you mentioned, where if there's too much money attached, so in that case it was 10% of a state's annual funds, um, then you might get into a coerciveness analysis, but not a commandeering analysis, because the state always has the choice to take the money or not take the money. The only question is, is it so much money that the state has no choice but to act, or is it enough where the state can actually make an informed decision? I'm gonna take a pause, Meredith. Do we have a Do hard stop at 11? Do we need to answer his question? Yes. Oh. I'm just, I'm. Oh. Totally. Okay. Yes. So one of you want to answer it? So yes, very crisply. quickly, there are many provisions in that bill that actually try to conflate um, immigration, civil immigration enforcement with policing. Um, and yeah, I think it would pose, it, it would raise serious constitutional problems. Okay. Yeah. Panelists, start getting ready. You're what I'm going to pare down to about 30 second closing comment, and I'm going to call on Wendy. Hi, Wendy Wayne. I'm on the ABA Commission on Immigration. Um, I wanted to ask many people that were seen being arrested um, by ICE in and around courthouses have pending cases, um, and um, that and they're maybe undocumented with a pending criminal case. Once they're arrested by ICE, they're held in detention. They are not brought back into state criminal court, so that case never gets resolved. Some of those cases, um, the prosecutor wants to dismiss them. Uh, there, the common or the the state may not be able to to prosecute it, um, so courts are unable then to resolve the cases. 
Um, the victims don't have closure on the cases, and it also prevents um, the individuals who are taken in ICE custody because they have a pending case, even if they're eligible for some relief, they, it will likely be denied because they have an open case, or if they're deported, they won't be able to lawfully return to the United States because they have a pending criminal case. And for some of those cases, those cases would otherwise be dismissed or the individuals would be found not guilty. So that impacts significantly state I mean, I, I guess I'm looking for a, a quick response for um, if states are feeling like this is really interfering with their prosecution, what response well, do you have? I can take that question for you. Um, I, I couldn't disagree more. I, I would say that, that when the local ICE uh, officials are aware that there is a pending matter, if they work very closely with the DA's offices and the, the uh, law enforcement officers to ensure if there's a, if there's a pending criminal matter, that they can get them ridded over back over to state custody, working with them through their through their state court, um, through their state judiciary to get them ridded back into state custody uh, for those proceedings. If we have an opportunity, we don't simply take them and remove them because we 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 uh, uh, we don't allow the victims to have you know closure in their cases, and we don't allow the the criminal prosecutions to go forward. So if we can do it at all possible, then we will work with them to get them back over into their custody so that they can complete those 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 pending criminal matters that are before the state courts because there is really really have no interest in, in, in simply whisking someone uh, out of the United States so that they don't stand trial. Uh, I, can, I can assure you that I, I'm well aware of situations where we have worked very collegially and cooperatively with the DA's offices to ensure that those individuals stick around for their trials, particularly if they're, they're significant felony matters. Uh, there, there may be some times when, uh, for example, the state doesn't really want to pursue the charge. Now, if we take them into our custody, a lot of times I can tell you the state and locals will simply wash their hands of it. We don't have to deal with it. They're going to be deported, so we don't have to pursue this, and we'll save the state and county some money. But, but we, we often we, we pursue, ask them to pursue those state and criminal uh, charges because it's important because that may be the only basis for removability that we can establish against that individual is having a criminal conviction. So I, I would just tell you that my understanding is that we work with them. I don't know the situations you're talking about. I'm right. happy to talk offline with you about right. those because uh, I don't want to leave that issue lingering, but I'm, I'm, that's my understanding. Thank you, Tracy. Sorry, we're going to have to wrap up because we have to vacate the room, so I'm going to go down and ask everybody for a 30 minute closing thought if you care to offer one. Seconds. I mean, sorry, 30 seconds. <laughs> that would really be all day. But um, I want to invite the panelists who do not have to rush out in a hurry um, to step outside and invite those of you who have questions we didn't reach who would like to speak with one or more of the panelists if they're available to continue that conversation um, outside. So Michelle, and I'm sorry, we really need to yeah. be on literally 30 seconds. Um, so, as several people have mentioned, today's panel was kind of a little trip down memory lane, and it brought back a lot of um, thoughts from the early 2000s, mid-2000s, when I first started working on these issues, and the post-9-11 policies were really focused on getting state and local police to enforce federal immigration laws. And coming out of that period, we saw a lot of studies um, indicating that um, Hispanics were being arrested for minor traffic violations at much higher rates after secure communities was initiated, for example. Um, other reports of people um, being arrested for pretextual reasons to get them into the jail. We also saw many horrific uh, reports of people who died because they didn't want to call an ambulance, for example. And I just hope that we can learn from the lessons of the past as we start this new era and this new conversation. Paramitha, sorry, super quick, please. Yeah. You sure? OK. <laughs> then you can take a whole minute. OK. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think uh, this time is uh, it, it's going to be a, it's, it's a really very important critical time. And it's really going to the challenging times of being able to figure out who we are as a country, how we address issues of immigration, policing, how we address um, our constitutional safeguards, how we address our due process protections, I believe are all on the line right now. Um, it is too easy to say that the rhetoric doesn't matter um, and that it doesn't impact the decisions that are being made on the ground. The fact is, is that many of us who have been doing this work know that it does. Um, and have seen uh, a disturbing rise um, in rhetoric, 
um, and also the impact that it has on our communities. Um, I would say that when it comes to the courts, um, we need to come back and decide uh, where we think police power should go. Um, and I think that right now, um, local communities and local uh, and states have made good decisions on sanctuary cities and sanctuary policies. They've made it in support of the communities that reside within them. Um, and that to attack them, I think, head on by executive orders, by threatening stripping of federal funding or creating additional penalties is frankly uh, not a good way to go for our country and will not actually heal some of the divisions that people say exist um, in the United States. Thank you, Paramitha. Betsy. It is a very uh, scary time for many people, and you lawyers play a very important role when it comes to immigration. Uh, we don't have a right to counsel in immigration proceedings, but by engaging in community groups, you can provide some security to immigrants who live in our midst. There are many people who are here who are supposedly illegal, but they may have a nascent claim to stay if they're helped by a lawyer to get various visas that would provide more security. There are many people who are green card holders who've never converted to citizenship for financial reasons or others, and with the help of counsel like you, you can bring them more security so that if they are arrested uh, or find themselves enmeshed in the criminal justice system, they won't find themselves deported. So thank you. Yes. Um, Tom. Public safety is based on uh, trust and confidence of the people that we serve. and. Uh, for local police department, uh, it's no different than for uh, the mission of a federal law enforcement agency. I believe that we can find the right balance where everybody's interests are served. Um, it is not served by local police being the immigration police, and any uh, influence or pressure to uh, engage in immigration enforcement uh, by local police is, is the wrong direction to go. Um, however, the, I, again, I believe that we can find the right local uh, the right balance um, between local and federal law enforcement agencies. And so um, my, I, I think we can support each other in our mission, but the federal government, and, and not that they need me to tell them how to do their job, uh, but the federal government needs to understand that if they want to have the trust and confidence of the, of the people that they serve, uh, they need to be transparent in what they do. If they, their focus is on criminals, they, they, will, get, they will have, the, uh, the and, and folks that are a danger to public safety, they will have the support and confidence of, of the public they serve. Um, if they're picking up folks that are here because they came from a god-awful situation in their country of origin, they have made a life of themselves in this country and haven't broken one law other than perhaps the one they broke when they entered into the country, then uh, they will, I think that they, you start to erode the, the trust and confidence of the people that we serve because why are you using your resources to, to focus on that individual when there's plenty of folks that I'm dealing with, the, the gangbangers who are doing armed robberies and plenty of other folks that are um, committing crimes that I will work every day of the week with my f federal colleagues to, uh, um, to, to uh, get them out of our community to make our community safer. But we've got to, I think, focus the priorities um, uh, in a way that, that uh, gets that trust and confidence from the public. Thank you. Chad. Thank you very much. There's one point where I could not agree with Paramitha more. It's that rhetoric matters. And so I call out as unhelpful the rhetoric which suggests that if you are a victim of a crime or a victim of domestic violence, and that if you go to a state or local police, that for some reason the attorney general wants you deported. That is not true. I call out the rhetoric that is unhelpful, which says that local police and, and ICE agents, by enforcing our nation's immigration laws, are somehow engaged in pretext or somehow sort of racial profiling. Again, that is unhelpful. We can find common ground on this, and the common ground is that if you are in the country illegally, you have no right to be here. And in situations where you have been charged or convicted of a very serious crime, the federal government is going to use its resources, the Department of Justice is going to use its resources to ensure that that threat to public safety is no longer present so that all of us can be safe. The Attorney General is committed to working with state and local police, is committed to hearing their concerns, and to working with everybody to make our nation safer. Thank you. Tracy. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, again, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here today on this very important topic. Let me just, let me just 
if I could, dispel the myth that judicial warrants are required to, to effect a civil arrest. That, that has never been the case. The Supreme Court has long held that uh, uh, arrests in public places are sufficient on based on probable cause. Um, so the extent to which we have administrative warrants, which are set forth in the statute, uh, Title VIII, Section 1357, establish probable cause. So the administrative warrants in and of themselves uh, are, are no less of a warrant because they're not issued by a, a judicial officer because I am not aware of a provision in the uh, Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure that allows a magistrate judge to issue a, a warrant in a civil immigration case. Those are simply for criminal matters. So Congress has set up this system under its plenary power to legislate on immigration, setting forth the individuals and the procedures that issue these warrants, that establish probable cause, and now the ICE detainers clearly have probable cause because they're atta attached to them or a warrant of removal or a warrant of arrest, establishing the basis for probable cause. Those are just as valid bases under the Constitution uh, as any other uh, if, 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 you know, use of the, uh, uh, of the uh, Fourth Amendment uh, uh, pursuant to an arrest of, for a civil matter. So I would just want to let everyone know here that we are uh, um, effecting arrest consistent with the law, consistent with the Constitution, based on the statutory framework that Congress set up for these types of, uh, of uh, enforcement actions under, this, under the civil enforcement actions under the Immigration Nationality Act. So I want, I want to let that, uh, I'm going to let you know, go with that, that these are consistent with law, they are pursuant to law, and they are no less uh, lawful because there's not a judicial warrant. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you so and Michael, your closing thoughts. I'm going to just be very quick and bookend what Michelle said. This was a trip down memory lane with uh, you know, how a lot of these laws and policies came into place post 9-11. I, I will say I agree with the Chief and, and Chad and the others that you know, no one wants to see detaining deaths. No one wants to you know, target individuals because of immigration, you know, nationality, et cetera. But I am also realistic enough to know that as we ramp up enforcement, we have to be mindful of those issues and make sure that as part of our procedures, we have somebody looking at that to make sure that we're, we're not doing things that are unintended. There aren't unintended consequences, and when we see those, we can head that off. So I think you know, it, it protects the government, it protects the individuals who are gonna be targeted, and it's the way that we have to proceed. Thank you, Michael. Meredith, we had a written request for one more question. Are we able to take it, or are we totally out of time? It's, all right. Um, Maria. Yeah. Um, the reason it was all you, and thank you for doing this. I had a lot of questions, but <laughs> I'll stick to, like, one. Um, and it would be for you, Chad. Um, you said that, obviously, um, you've, uh, most of all of you made it clear that immigration um, enforcement is a federal uh, task. So um, I was wondering, uh, with the laws that are uh, going through the Hill now, like the, the one on the Judiciary Committee, one of the bills uh, would allow states to make up their own immigration laws so that it, if we already have a, a tangled up system, having 50 different laws would probably make it a lot tougher for all of you here. So I was wondering what sort of guidance or what sort of um, behind the scenes work are you guys doing at DOJ with people on the Hill to make sure that they don't make the system, the system that's already bad to make it worse for all of you involved in immigration enforcement? Well, thank you for that question. So I'm not familiar with actually the specific bill that you're talking about that's in front of. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. I haven't personally been involved in that. I, I will say that everything that we do, um, we want to make consistent with law. And so the, the Supreme Court held in the United States v. Arizona, and I think the Constitution recognizes, and I think we've all recognized, that having a patchwork of contradictory uh, immigration regulations is unhelpful, and it's not what is going to create the sort of clarity that we need and in, in, in create who is going to be accountable. And so again, while I can't comment on that specific piece of legislation, I would sort of just, again, reiterate what the American Immigration Council said on Arizona, that in the current environment, it is unclear who is responsible for setting immigration enforcement priorities and who is responsible for their success or failure. We want to change that. We want to make it clear that the Department of Justice is responsible, DHS is responsible for setting immigration authorities, and where states and local jurisdictions feel that they can deviate from those priorities, that creates this patchwork of conflicting mandates that is unhelpful. 
Um, I want to uh, end on that note. I want to, um, first of all, thank everyone for your patience with us in running a few minutes over time and to our hosts here at the Press Club for allowing us a few extra minutes in the room. I want to thank the Commission on Immigration and the Section um, on Civil Rights and Tell me now, I'm going to forget the name. I was doing so good until now, civil rights and social justice. I knew I would forget that before the day was over. Um, anyway, thank both of those entities for co-sponsoring this um, important program. It's obvious how complicated the issues are, um, how difficult it is to resolve them with uh, um, satisfaction on both sides of the issue, but I think one thing we can all agree on is that we've had a really stellar group of people presenting to us and sharing the views. <laughs>